All right, so we are now recording. Um, and yeah, thanks again uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about um, R and R Studio before we get started, and then we'll do the actual hands-on uh, part of the workshop. So before I do that, um, I realize I've been talking to you for like 15 minutes and you still don't know who I am. So hi, I'm Irini. Um, uh, I can hear someone's uh, audio, so if you could all make sure that you're please um, muted, that would be wonderful. Okay. So hi, I'm Irini, um, and I am a community manager at the Alan Turing Institute, supporting the A for Multiple uh, Long-Term Conditions project. Um, my background is not in health uh, in any shape, way, or form. Uh, I'm actually a psycholinguist, which is basically a psychologist that uh, studies language. Um, so, you know, my background was completely non-computational. I started um, doing a bit more programming when I did my PhD, also in psycholinguistics, and I had to learn how to work with data using R, and I totally fell in love with it. Um, I started at the same time learning about the importance of open science and reproducibility. So I also started developing uh, reproducible workflows in R for myself. And I helped co-found um, an R Ladies chapter. And I'll mention what that is uh, in a moment. Uh, after my PhD, I um, got a job as a trainer on research data management and open science at the Delft University of Technology, where I uh, started teaching intros to R um, as a data carpentry instructor. Data Carpentry is um, a nonprofit organization teaching digital skills, uh, mostly at the beginner level. Um, and this workshop that I'm giving at the moment is very heavily based uh, on a Data Carpentry lesson. And I have linked those original materials um, in various places if that's something that is interesting to you. Um, I'm currently, as I said, the community manager uh, for open collaboration at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, I'm still kind of figuring out what I want to do with uh, R in this position. Obviously, I'm still doing a bit of teaching. Um, I'd also be super keen to help support um, a user group of people trying to learn R. R is a very supportive community, um, and I've always enjoyed being in those spaces. So um, if, you know, having support from other people learning R at the same time as you is something that would be helpful for you, please do let me know. I'd be very keen um, to do something like that. Um, Ellen, would you like to say a few words about yourself as well? Hello. Um, I'm not with the Alan Turing Institute. Um, I'm a research associate at Newcastle University, but I've used R quite a lot over the past um, like seven or eight years, I guess, which is why I've volunteer to help out. Um, my background is mainly in entomology, which is the study of insects, but I've spent the last four or five years specialising a bit more in um, data analysis and applied statistics, so I'm now working in biostatistics. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so that's a bit about us. Um, and now to the, the main event, uh, R. So uh, you're all here, so I assume you have your own reasons for wanting to learn R, but I always like to talk about, you know, some things that I think are really important uh, and helpful for R. So R is a programming language and the software um, used to interpret the scripts written uh, with it, which is a little bit confusing, but um, it is free and it is open source, which is uh, amazing, especially uh, if you are in a transitional period, you know, being between uh, academic jobs and you don't have anyone to pay your licenses for you. So with R, you don't have to worry about that. Um, R is really great for uh, reproducibility. So um, like all programming languages, R is not point and click. So when you try to repeat an analysis that you run before, you don't have to remember what buttons you pressed in what order, like in SPSS, for example. Instead, you write down all of those commands down um, in a script, and you have that script in the future. You can always just repeat those steps as they're written down there. Um, R is also great for working with data, as it was created by statisticians for statistics. So because of that, kind of history, it has really useful features for data analysis. So for example, working with missing data, which we'll do a little bit today. And it also allows you to make really beautiful visualizations, which uh, I really enjoy. Um, 
R is also great for working in any discipline that you're in. As I said, R is open source, which means that anyone can contribute code to extend uh, the base R functionality. Uh, currently, there's more than 10,000 packages with these like additional features, um, which makes it easy to, you know, there are packages basically to help you work in any discipline you're interested in. And there are also communities that support the use of R in various uh, fields, so for example, Relevant for this uh, group, I think, would be the NHS R community, uh, which is about supporting the use of R um, in the NHS. Uh, R Ladies is another um, community uh, that supports the use of R, mostly for um, women and under underrepresented genders. Um, so, as I said, R filled with lovely people that uh, tend to want to help. So. It's a really nice uh, place to get started with programming as well. Uh, so why RStudio? I asked you to install two things, R and RStudio for uh, these workshops. So RStudio is an integrated development environment, um, which has a free and open source version, uh, which is what we'll be using for these, project, uh, for these workshops, which is great. Um, RStudio makes it much easier to interact with R, uh, and it even extends it in some ways. So, the way that our studio makes it easier to work, to interact with R um, and to develop code is by allowing us to navigate computer files, for example, through uh, R studio. Uh, it helps us inspect uh, the variables that we create and visualize the plots we generate. So that will come in very handy on day four when we work uh, on data visualization. Um, during these workshops, we will use R entirely through R studio. I think I can count the times I've used R without R Studio uh, in the fingers of one hand. Um, R Studio also supports reproducibility through features like projects, um, and I'll say more about projects in a moment. Uh, and it also provides a graphical user interface to work with Git, uh, the version control um, system. So if that's something you'd like to learn about, do let me know. We can have an additional session uh, to work on that. Um, some learning objectives for today, uh, we'll learn how to navigate the RStudio graphical user interface, uh, often, often abbreviated as GUI. Uh, we'll learn how to install some of those 10,000 plus packages to access additional functionality. We'll perform some simple arithmetic calculations in R um, and try to understand some programming terms like objects, functions, arguments, and vectors. And we'll also play around with missing data a bit. So um, I mentioned our projects before and that they help with reproducibility. So one of the ways in which I think our projects are super useful for reproducibility is that they simplify working with file paths, which I know sounds boring, but is actually very important. <laughs> so here you see two ways of reading data into R. Both of these things work. They both access exactly the same file. Um, don't worry about, you know, like the specifics over here. These are all things that we'll learn during the workshop. But I just want you to look at this red thing. This is the path, uh, what I call here an absolute path. Um, and this is a relative path. Um, so could you please write uh, in the chat if you think uh, option one is more reproducible or option two? Uh, and if you'd like, you can also tell us um, why you think um, the option you chose is more reproducible. And reproducibility, uh, in case you don't know what that means, uh, means uh, taking the same data, taking the same code of a research project and getting the same results. Okay, interesting. Some people are saying option two, uh, one person is saying option one, most people are saying option two. Um, I would agree option two is um, more reproducible um, because, um, so to read option one, um, you would have to follow this exact path. So you would have to start in this user's uh, location, go to E Zorumpa. Okay, if your name is not E Zorumpa, that is, if you're not me or a handful of other people, this would make your code break because this is not a location that you have in your computer. 
Um, but even if you circumvented that, you then still have to have this exact uh, file structure to be able to access um, a file and open it in R. And as you can see, I've made some unusual choices here uh, in my file structure. Believe it or not, um, this is not uh, just to, you know, talk about the irreproducibility of my file paths. This was actually my chosen <laughs> file structure, uh, but please don't judge me. Um, with this path over here, uh, all you need to have is um, the last two folders be uh, the last folder be data and the file that you want um, to access to be called covid underscore data dot csv. Um, so basically what this means is that, uh, oh, sorry, I meant, I should have said option two here. Uh, that is a very, very confusing typo. Please, please ignore the option one there. Um, Option two is more reproducible because it allows you to move your project around on your computer. So this last bit over here could live as the last bit of any of those, um, as a, a very different uh, file path over here, and it would still work. So that would work on my computer if I moved it around. It would also work in someone else's computer um, if I gave it to them. If that's still a bit confusing, don't worry. Um, we'll, we will try this uh, in a moment. The other way in which our projects uh, are helpful for reproducibility is that um, they kind of push you towards a certain good practice, um, which is to keep all files related to a project in one single folder, which we call the working directory. So this will include things like your data, uh, your scripts that you write, any outputs uh, of your data analysis and the documentation. Uh, this makes sharing um, this you know, pipeline um, a lot easier because everything you need is already in one place. It also makes documenting your projects easier because um, the things that work together are already in the same place. So you don't have to you know, introduce a lot of different data and code that does completely you know, separate things. You can say that this script works on this data and does, you know, and produces this thing, you know, going from your data to your scripts to your output. So um, a folder structure that we will be using for this workshop is something that looks like this. So you have your working directory and within that you have a folder for your raw data, a folder for your clean data, any figures, um, your scripts um, and various other pieces of documentation. Okay, I've done a lot of talking, so I'll actually uh, finally do some things. So what I would like you all to do now is uh, open your R Studio, And uh, you should see something like this. Please give us a green check mark um, if you have opened your R Studio, and then I will start uh, displaying how to do things. And I can't actually see things. So uh, Ellen, if you could tell me when there are a few green ticks, um, I will start demoing. It was on five and then it went down to four. So I don't know if people are oh, it's back <laughs> off to five. <laughs> All right, uh, that sounds pretty good to me. Uh, so I will start uh, explaining what we're going to do. So, um, if you could go to this file uh, tab in your R Studio, and this will look different depending on whether you're on Windows or on Mac, um, but somewhere at the top left, there should be a menu that says file. So if you click on that, there should be an option um, that says new project. So please find that option and click on it. So file, new project. And um, you should see a new project wizard pop up, which gives you various options uh, on where to create your repository or how to create your repository. We will just make a new directory, a new folder, basically to save all the things that we'll be doing. So click on new directory and then on new project in the next step. 
And then uh, in your wizard, uh, R will ask you um, how you would like to call this new folder that you're creating. Um, so give it um, a sensible name like um, R intro. Um, and then you need to tell R where you want to create that uh, subdirectory. Ooh, uh, in the name, uh, please make sure that you don't use any uh, spaces or any special characters. If you want to separate words from one another, please use something like a hyphen or an underscore. So like this is a um, hyphen or an underscore. I prefer hyphens, so I'm gonna leave it to hyphen. Um, and then you can just browse your computer and you know, go somewhere where it is sensible for you to store this. Uh, it can be your documents folder, it can be your desktop, it doesn't really matter. And just click on open. Um, and once you have given your directory a name and you have chosen a place to um, create this directory, you can go ahead and click on create a project. Okay. So what that should have done is um, basically open a new um, a new R window. And now if you look at the top right, you should see this kind of like bluish, um, kind of like, I don't really know, a, a cube uh, with R that says R intro or whatever else you have named um, your project. So what having this R project does is any files that we want to create uh, in this project and access, um, the starting point for all those file paths will just be um, the location where this R project file is located. And that means that we will be using these relative paths um, that are helpful for reproducibility. Okay. Um, cool. Has uh, everyone been able to create uh, a new project? If not, please give us um, a red X uh, so we can uh, help you out. It looks like there's no X, it's just some green ticks. But I would say, um, are you share are you meant to be sharing your r studio session because i can only see your uh your slides your brow it looks like your browser so i'm not sure if you were is yes. it sharing the wrong screen yes, i am i am sharing my wrong screen oh my god i'm so sorry yes i'm going to share my i mean it was helpful anyway i think to have the instructions there anyway because <laughs> that that's probably more useful because then everybody can read them and see where they are regardless of what point in the chain they're at Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, good that you were able to follow that and good that we caught it before I started typing. All right. So um, hopefully uh, you can now see my screen, uh, the correct screen. Um, and what you should be seeing is um, these three kind of um, windows on RStudio. So this over here is the console. You can see that uh, if you put your cursor over here next to this kind of like greater than sign, uh, you'll see a blinking cursor. That means that R is ready for us to tell it what to do. We'll get back to the console in a bit. Um, over here at the top, we can see that this says environment. Um, it's currently empty because we haven't done anything yet. Uh, but once we start, you know, creating variables and all sorts of things, those will start appearing over here. Um, and there's also this history tab where once we start writing commands and telling R what to do, um, it will save them and we can see them over here. And underneath, um, this has various uh, things as you can see. So uh, one of them is this files tab. So what this displays is literally the contents of the folder in which I am uh, in my computer. I created a new directory, so it's fairly empty, except for this R project uh, file. Um, I can also see this tab here where I will be able to see our plots when we create them on day four. Uh, and really importantly, there's this help tab where you can go um, to search for anything that is causing you trouble in R. Okay. So I'm gonna go back to this files tab over here. 
And I mentioned before that uh, we're going to be working with a folder structure where we have these like uh, our data separated from our scripts, separated from our outputs, and so on and so forth. I'm going to start creating this uh, folder structure now, and I can do this directly from our studio. So I'm just going to go to this icon over here uh, where I can see this folder with the plus sign, uh, and I'm going to click on it to create a new folder. And I'm going to name this folder scripts. Okay, so I clicked on this folder with the plus icon. Um, this wizard opened and I wrote the word scripts because I'm creating my scripts folder. And now I'm going to click OK. And you can see that this has now appeared um, in this file. If I go to my, um, so this is just like my finder. Uh, if I go to this folder that I created, you can see that it has also created uh, the scripts folder. So this is exactly the same. OK. So now that I have a folder to save my scripts, I'm also going to actually create a script. Um, so again, I'm going to go to this file uh, tab over here. I'm going to click on it um, and, oh, <laughs> okay, I still had Finder um, selected, so it was uh, doing the wrong thing. But now that I'm on R Studio, uh, if I go to this files tab uh, and I click on new file in R script, so file, new file, our script. This will open a new script for me. And I'm just going to save it uh, immediately. And I'm going to go uh, into this R, uh, the scripts folder that I just created. And I will save my script in there. Um, give it a sensible name. I'm going to call this our intro demo. Um, and you can add uh, the R extension, or uh, you can just leave the name and R Studio will give it the right uh, extension for you. So yeah, just give it a sensible name, make sure you save it inside your scripts folder, and I'm going to click Save. All right. Um, so now we have the view that you normally have when you work with our studio. We have our script, our console, our environment, and our files. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the relationship between um, the script and the console. So in programming, you know, what we do is we write commands and we execute those commands to tell uh, the software that we're running what we want it to do. Both the script and the console allow you to do that. So it allows you to talk to R. Um, but they have different purposes. So in the console, you would write things that are just one off, that you want to do once, that you don't want to repeat. Um, in the script, you write things that um, you will be working on for a while and that you'll want to do multiple times. So for example, if you're developing a data analysis pipeline, uh, you would be doing that in your script, um, partly because you know, it's going to take you multiple you know, days probably to uh, write out all the script that you want, um, and also because you want that information saved uh, so that you can you know, we run your analysis and um, are able to share it with people. The purposes of those two things will become clearer the longer that you use R and practice it. Um, but that's kind of the distinction. Um, a good example of something that you would only want to do once um, is installing one of those packages that I mentioned in the introduction. Um, so we're just going to do that now. We're going to install a package that we'll be using a lot during these workshops. So I'm over here in my console. Um, I've placed my cursor here, um, and the cursor is blinking, so I can tell our things, uh, our, uh, what to do. Um, and I'm going to type install dot packages. And you can see that R had already suggested that to me because it's trying to be helpful uh, and predict what it is that I want. Um, but I'm just trying to take this uh, slow so that you know uh, no one gets confused. So just do the same thing, um, write install dot 
packages, and then open and close parentheses. This is a function um, that does a thing. This specific function um, installs packages, as the name would suggest. Um, however, um, R doesn't know what package I want to install yet. So to do that, I need to write the name of the package uh, in these parentheses. So I'm going to open and close parentheses, uh, open and close uh, quotation marks, and within write, within that write uh, the word tidyverse. So that's the name of the package that we will be um, installing. So make sure that this is exactly what you have written: install dot packages, open parentheses, open quotation marks, the word tidyverse, and then close quotation marks and close parentheses, and then hit um, the button enter or return. And you should see something like the messages uh, that I am getting uh, in my console. It's a bit slower than usual. You can see that R uh, is thinking because it had that uh, little stop sign over here. OK, and that is done. Um, and what I see now in my console is which URL it tried, that it downloaded something, and that the downloaded binary packages are in X. Um, if this is what you see on your uh, screen, then perfect. You have successfully installed packages, installed uh, tidyverse. If that's not what you see, um, you've probably made a typo. Um, so if you've made a typo in the install packages uh, part of the of the command, um you will see something like install packages uh, is not recognized um if you've made a typo in tidyverse you'll see something like this package isn't available for your version of r which is a deeply unhelpful message uh, but basically it means you've misspelled the package name um but if you don't see any error messages and you just see what i got uh, then you have installed are, uh, you have installed Tidyverse, which is excellent. Um, again, give us a green tick uh, if that has all worked for you. Give us um, a red X if it hasn't. Is that all looking good, Ellen? Uh, I've got five green ticks, no Xs. Wonderful. Okay, so I will move on. Uh, if something does come up, uh, please do let uh, Ellen know. Okay, so that was a function. That was actually a bit of a big step. Uh, so let's start with something a bit simpler. Um, so one easy thing that you can try to do in R is just have it uh, do some math for you. So for example, if, uh, and I've moved over here to the script now because um, I want to save everything that I write. Um, in this workshop, because I will then um, well, save the script and share it with you. So if at any point you get lost during the session, uh, you can go back uh, to what I've written uh, in this live demo thing uh, and follow along later. So I'm writing this in the script. Um, so let's try, um, you know, something simple addition. So I've written three plus five. Um, before in the console, I could run, um, I could execute uh, commands by clicking on enter or return. If I do this on the script, it's not going to work. It's just going to go to the next line. Um, but if you go back uh, and put your cursor on the line um, that you have written this, um, this addition <laughs> uh, calculation, and you click on um, control uh, enter or command return, then um, it will run and you will see the result um, here in the console. So unsurprisingly, R tells us that uh, if you do three plus five, uh, you get eight. It's no big surprise, um, but it's nice to, um, you know, get used to how we execute commands in R and where the results appear. So the result appeared here in the console. You can try all sorts of math. Um, you can do 12 divided by five, and again, do command and return or control and enter. And R will tell you how much 12 divided by five is. You can try this with all sorts of 
um, maths or simple calculations, and this will work just fine. Um, but of course, that's kind of using R as a glorified calculator. Um, that's not really <laughs> why you probably want to learn programming. Uh, in you know, one of the useful things um, about programming languages is that they let us assign values to objects. So that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to create um, an object. Um, in most programming languages, objects are called variables. You can use those interchangeably um, for this level of doing R, it's totally fine. So I'm going to call this object or variable um, weight. Uh, and I like the metric system, so I'm going to specify that it is in kilograms. So this is an object uh, or a variable that I just came up with. It doesn't exist in R, I just thought of it, um, I'm creating it. So this is going to be its name. Um, and now I want to assign a value to it to say that you know the weight in kilograms is a certain number. To do that in R, we use something called the assignment operator, which is this kind of funky looking arrow. So it's the smaller than sign and uh, the hyphen. Make sure that those are you know, next to each other. Uh, there isn't a space in between or anything like that. Uh, so smaller than sign and dash, um, and I'm going to assign 65. So what that looks like, if you look at it, is that you're taking 65 and you're putting it inside uh, this variable of weight underscore kilograms. And if I uh, execute this command by running um, command and return or control enter, we can see that this time in the console, um, R run this command uh, that we asked it to, but it hasn't given us anything back, right? So before it kind of copied the, the thing that we run um, and it gave us an output, this time it hasn't given us an output. Instead, uh, what if we look over here in our environment is that R has now saved um, this variable, weight kilograms um, and its value. So it knows two things, that weight kilogram is something that exists, it didn't know that before, and that its value is 65. So this is how you assign objects in, uh, how you assign values to objects um, in R. Um, as I mentioned, this weight underscore kilogram uh, object is something that I just came up with. Uh, it could have been anything um, within bounds. Uh, so how you name things in R is a little bit constrained. So for example, um, your object names can't start with numbers. Um, you shouldn't use spaces uh, if you want to you know, separate two words. Um, I would recommend you use uh, this underscore. Um, and importantly, um, R is case sensitive. So if I instead had written weight underscore kilograms with a capital K and had given that you know, value of 55 and executed this command, then that is a completely separate um, object over here, right? So to R, weight in kilograms uh, with a small k and weight in kilograms with a capital K are entirely different things. He, uh, R does not see any relation between those things, completely separate, okay? So be mindful of that because R is case sensitive and will not understand, um, you know, if you've just forgotten uh, what capitalization you used. Um, I hope everyone's following. Um, if not, uh, feel free to uh, interrupt, let us know. Okay, so now that R um, knows that weight uh, underscore kilograms is a variable uh, and it knows its value, um, I can do things with it. So let's say uh, that I moved to the States um, and people use pounds. Um, so I wanted to convert my weight in kilograms to weight in pounds. So the way to do that is to multiply my weight in kilograms with 2.2. Uh, so if I just write 2.2 and multiply that by weight in kilograms, oops, <laughs> kilograms. Oh yes. Um, 
R lets you like autocomplete things. So you can see that uh, these things marked with purple are uh, user generated objects. And these things in blue are uh, functions uh, that R already knows about. Um, so this is quite handy for, you know, like writing a little bit faster. So if I uh, multiply 2.2 uh, 2 .2 by uh, my weight in kilograms and I execute this command um, over here in the console, I get the answer that uh, the weight of uh, 65 kilos in pounds is uh, 143. Okay. And I could even um, take this whole thing and save it in a new object called weight in pounds, right? So again, I'm creating a completely new object. I've just thought of it. Um, well, I haven't just thought of it, but R doesn't know about it. Um, and this is going to be the name of my object. And I'm going to type the assignment operator, smaller than sign with the dash. Um, and I'm going to assign to it the value of you know, the, the formula to calculate weight in pounds from weight in kilograms. So 2.2 .2 multiplied by weight in kilograms. And if I now execute this command, I see that now weight in pounds also lives in my environment uh, and R knows what it is and knows what its value is. Um, so hopefully, uh, again, that makes sense. Um, so as easy as it is to create objects and assign them values, um, it is also very easy to change those values. So R is not very attached to them. So um, if I, you know, let's say that these are like patient data or whatever, um, you know, one of my patient's data uh, one of my patients weight is 65 but now i have another patient uh, and their weight is something else so i can update um, that person's weight uh, by writing the same um, object variable uh, object name that i wrote before so weight underscore kilograms all small and now instead of 65 i'm going to say that you know this person is 80 kilos and i am going to execute it and that is going to update the value of uh, weight in kilograms. Um, so what I would like you to think about uh, right now is what happens to um, the object weight in pounds. So weight in pounds is something that we calculated based on the weight uh, kilograms um, object. So what do you think uh, has happened there? So take a few minutes uh, to think about it. Um, I've put down three minutes here. Uh, we may need less time than that. Um, so yeah, what do you think uh, has happened now and uh, how do you find out um, what it is? Give us a green check mark. Uh, once you have an answer, give us a red X. Um, if um, you're a bit lost, Yes, uh, there's a comment in the chat that we can write uh, weight in pounds and check uh, what the value of that variable is. Um, and it will show that it hasn't updated it um, itself. That is correct. Um, does everyone um, understand that? Uh, does that make sense? And what would you do to update um, the weight in pounds to 
B for you know, the most recent value of weight in kilograms. Yes, that's right. Uh, there was no reassignment for the weight in pounds after weight in kilograms was updated. So the value of the weight in pounds uh, is also not updated. Um, so if exactly, if we rerun the line that assigns weight in pounds, then it will use the most recent value of weight in kilograms or the current value of weight in kilograms and weight in pounds uh, will be updated. So hopefully that makes sense to people. Um, yeah, so in the solution here, I will also say, because we have not rerun the code, um, after assigning the new value, the value of weight in pounds is still the old one. Um, so if I go back to our studio and just uh, show what I mean. So if I type weight in pounds and run this, you can see it tells us it's 143. Um, but if I just copy this page, so I just copied and pasted this code just to make it a little bit faster. Um, if I run this again, then we see that um, this has updated from 143 to 876. Um, so this is getting uh, my script uh, is not very long, but it's already getting a little bit confusing. Um, so I'm just going to show you how to add uh, comments. Um, in R, all programming languages basically allow you to add comments, uh, which are for humans. So R does not understand comments. It completely ignores them. It does not evaluate them. It is to leave notes for yourself or for other people that will be looking at your code. And you do that by adding this uh, pound sign. Oh no. Um, I see that uh, someone just joined us. Um, hopefully that was just internet uh, messing something up and you're not just joining us for the first time now. Um, Okay, so I was talking about comments. You add comments by uh, adding this pound sign and writing some text after it. So here I will just say, this is how you do math in R. So if I run this comment, um, like nothing really changes. So R still runs the code underneath and it can see this comment over here, but it doesn't do anything with it. It doesn't change uh, the output. So I can use this as headers or you know, for extra information in any way that I want. So I'll just add a few headers over here um, and just say assigning values to objects. Um, and this is uh, for exercise one you can do this uh, or not it doesn't matter hugely it's just to make it a little bit easier to follow what is happening um also note that if you type this pound sign anything after it um will be uh, a comment so it doesn't have to be at the beginning of a new line though I do think it is a bit cleaner if it is at the beginning of a new line um, rather than just after some code, but you can also do that. So here I can explain that this is like um, the formula to convert, I'm very bad at typing, from kilos to pounds. Okay, so that's just a quick thing to uh, mention comments. Uh, and I actually have another um, exercise for you. Um, so this exercise, uh, I would like you to create two variables, one called weight and one called height, and assign each of them values, or whatever values you want, it doesn't really matter. Then I want you to create a third variable called BMI and give it a value 
using the weight and height variables that you just created. And I will give you a couple of hints um, in case you don't know the BMI formula off the top of your head, which why would you? Um, it is um, the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters, and then the height in meters is uh, squared. So that's one hint. And the other hint is uh, because you probably don't know how to square <laughs> numbers in R, you do it by adding this little carrot um, and the number two. So if you want to square uh, three, you write three, little carrot, two, and that will give you nine. Uh, so please try that. Uh, I'll give you five minutes for this. And I won't stop um, this time um, before the five minutes have gone. So if you finish a bit earlier, you can also just like you know, sit up, go get some water. <laughs> And I saw that someone just joined us. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have much time to catch you up, um, but uh, we're just doing um, an exercise with um, assigning values to objects in R. So please just open R Studio, um, create a new file uh, by going to the file uh, menu uh, and create a new script. Um, and hopefully you can follow along from here. Um, we can catch you up um, at the end of this, uh, if that's helpful. Um, I see a couple of uh, green uh, check marks. Uh, that's great that you're done. Um, you have about a minute left. Uh, please feel free to go stretch your legs, uh, get a glass of water, um, and we'll continue in about a minute.
Oh, great. We are out of time and um, I see uh, quite a few green check marks. So that is great. Um, I will just um, also demo the um, solution. Um, to the people that just joined us, um, please try to follow along um, as well as you can. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to stay um, after the end of the session and try to catch you up with things. Um, so now I'm just going to um, show how you would solve that exercise. So first, uh, you had to create a new variable called weight uh, and assign it a value. I'll just give it a random value, I don't know, like 89 um, and height in meters. Um, and I'll just give that a 1.8. Um, and I will run both of these. So you can also select um, multiple lines of code and run them at the same time. And R will run them you know, uh, in order. So those two have now been created. And then uh, to calculate uh, the BMI, I create a new object called BMI. I write the assignment arrow. And then the formula was uh, weight divided by height squared. So weight divided by height. And this is how you type squared in R. So if I now run this, um, I can see that the BMI for this uh, fictional person is this. And I just wanted to say <laughs> that for people that do work with the BMI, I would very much recommend this excellent episode from the podcast maintenance phase about the history uh, of the BMI and the problems with using it. So if you're into podcasts, um, I highly recommend listening to this. Um, the slides. Um, I have not given you the link to the slides. I will give you the link to the slides. They're already on GitHub, so you can access everything there. Okay. Um, so um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, functions. So functions in programming are basically um, kind of like canned scripts that do a specific task. Um, they usually uh, have some kind of input, which we call an argument, and they sometimes give an output. Um, they, this is a very general uh, introduction to functions, um, but we already saw a function in today's workshop, actually, when we uh, installed um, a package, right? When we installed uh, the tidyverse package, uh, we called the function install packages, which took uh, one input, um, one argument um, called, uh, you know, the name of the package that you wanted to install. Um, so let's look at a different um, function. Um, Right now, uh, I will just show you a useful uh, function uh, called round. As you can see, R is again trying to be helpful. It's telling me how to use uh, round and you know like various bits of documentation. Uh, if that's distracting to you, don't worry. Uh, you can just ignore it. Um, so in R, uh, to use functions, the first thing you do is you write the name of the function. And you just have to know names of functions. Obviously, this takes time uh, to learn. Um, but some of them are fairly um, well named, so they do what they say. So round uh, rounds numbers. And then you write, uh, you open and close parentheses. So this is always what you will see uh, with functions in R, uh, the name of the function, open and close parentheses. And um, within those parentheses, you write um, the input or the argument that this function takes. So um, here, what, you know, um, the input, the argument would be is some kind of number that we want to round. So that could be, for example, 3.14159, right? So um, I just want to round uh, pi. So if I execute this command by uh, command 
return or control enter. You can see in the console that R has done that for us. It has rounded uh, 3.14159 uh, down to three. Right, so that's nice. Um, just to make it a bit clearer how this is useful, you know, in your work, let's say that you're trying to get, you know, some numbers uh, for a table to put in your paper, uh, and you need to, you know, uh, report some BMIs, for example, that you've calculated, you can again, you know, use this function by writing around, opening close parentheses, and writing the BMI that will calculate it before. And if I write this now, uh, over here in the console, I get um, the number 27. So you can use, you know, these arguments over here. Um, they can also be uh, objects that you yourself have created um, in the in your workflow. Um, okay, so that is how you use round. But you know, especially for something like pi, people usually don't round it down uh, to three. They usually round it to something like one three point one four. Um, so how would you do that in this uh, function? Um, it, it doesn't seem obvious at the moment, right? Because we've given it the one argument. But R, um, can you destroy a function through mistakenly assigning something? That's a good question. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so uh, let's uh, think about how you would um, um, only have uh, two digits behind this decimal point um, in the round function. So I mentioned when I was giving you a bit of a tour of our studio, this um, help um, tab over here. So if you go to the search bar and type round, uh, the function round and run this um, by clicking enter, um, you will see the documentation for this function, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, I use this all the time because I don't remember how I'm supposed to use something. And if you scroll further down, um, you see a section called arguments, and it tells you what kinds of arguments um, that function takes. So one argument is this um, the number, basically, that you want to round. And there's also an optional argument, this digits um, argument, that um, you can use to specify how many digits after the decimal point you want. So if I go over here and write digits and then equals two, so two, and run this. Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah, that works for the BMI as well. Um, I was trying to write it here, uh, but whatever. Um, then you get uh, 3.14. So uh, with functions, you have some um, arguments that you always need to specify, uh, but sometimes uh, you don't have to specify um, some of the arguments. And when you don't have to specify those arguments, they use a default that the person who created those functions decided was a sensible one. So the default for the digits uh, argument in the round function is zero. So if you don't specify how many digits you want, uh, you will get back a number rounded uh, without any decimal points. So these, uh, these kinds of arguments that you don't have to specify, uh, they're called options. Um, and you could even just get rid of this uh, digits equals zero and just run it like this. Um, and it would still work uh, because R knows what the other, you know, um, argument is for that function. Um, but if you do that, then someone reading your code who's not as familiar with that function um, may not understand what it's doing. So my preference is usually to um, actually specify um, what it is that you're doing here, especially at the beginning. Um, a nice thing, if you are specifying uh, the various arguments, is that you can also move them around. So I'm just going to type this again. So I could write round digits equals 
two. Um, and then uh, the thing that I want to round, which is this, and it will work. See, again, uh, it rounds it to the second decimal point. If I didn't specify that this was digits uh, and I run this, then I would get two back, right? Which is obviously um, the wrong answer. What R is trying to do is round the number two to the third point one four one five nine <laughs> decimal point, which obviously um, does not make sense. Okay. Um, so that is it about functions. Um, and I just wanted to give a bit of a summary of what I just said, that functions are like canned scripts that do a specific task. They usually take some kind of input, which we call an argument, and they often give back some kind of output, but not always. Um, running or executing a function, uh, we call that calling a function. Um, just some more terminology for you. <laughs> Um, and the arguments of functions can be anything. They can be numbers, they can be file names. So remember um, early in the beginning when I was telling you about file paths, um, you know, that whole path that I was asking you to compare uh, was an argument um, for that function. Um, and of course, uh, objects that you have created can also be arguments uh, for a function as we showed with using the BMI um, in the round function. Um, so that's all I had to say about functions. Um, and I will now move on to vectors, unless uh, there are any questions, which if there are, please let us know. I'm not hearing anyone unmute or shout at me, so I will assume that everything is fine. Um, okay, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about is something called vectors. Um, if we have any people with a physics background, not that kind of vector. So um, a vector in R is kind of the most basic data structure. And when I say basic, I mean, <laughs> that it's what more complicated data structures use um, to be built. It's like the atom of R. Um, and they are really the workhorse of R. Uh, you use vectors all the time um, when you work in R. And what they consist of is um, multiple values that all belong to the same type. So they're all numbers or they're all characters or something like that. And you create vectors by um, a function, uh, the C function, uh, which stands for concatenate. Um, and you can assign uh, vectors to objects uh, the same way that we assigned single values to objects. So to give you a bit of a preview of the data we'll be working on uh, in this workshop series, um, let's create a vector with COVID cases. Yay. Okay, but anyway, so I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a numerical vector. So it's going to contain numbers. Uh, and I'm going to put this series of numbers into the COVID cases uh, object. So the way I do that is I type C, open and close parentheses. This is how you do functions in R. And within that C function, I'm going to write some numbers, uh, which are going to be more or less the weekly numbers of cases of COVID in the UK when the pandemic started. So I'm going to write zero and then comma, I like to put a space after my commas just for readability. Uh, one, three, one, and 61. So this is how you create a vector. Again, you write the number C, stands for concatenate, open and close parentheses, and you write the various values you want to put in your vector separated by commas. And I'm now going to execute this. 
And if I look over here, um, we can see my COVID cases um, variable object and the values that it's associated with. Um, so this is a, a numerical vector, right? It has numbers in it. Um, you can also create um, vectors that have words in them or characters. So something else that you know people keep track of when it comes to COVID is you know the various uh, countries and how many uh, cases they had. So now I'm going to create another vector that I'm going to call countries. And what I'm going to say there um, is the name of some countries. So I'm going to write the assignment operator, C for concatenate, open and close parentheses. And in there, I'm going to name, to write the country names. Notice that I'm writing uh, these things between um, quotation marks. So I'm going to write United Kingdom. So all of that is in quotation marks. I've closed the quotation marks. Now I write comma, uh, space, and I'm going to write the name of another country. The Netherlands. Again, this is in quotation marks, and then comma, and Greece. So this is the country I lived, the country I worked in, and the country I'm from. So I was keeping close <laughs> attention to the COVID cases in those three places. So if I run this now, you'll see um, another uh, vector appear here in my environment called countries that has um, three values, United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and something else that, oops, that R doesn't have space to show me. OK. So the reason that these things are in quotation marks is because basically R doesn't know what these things are. So if I tell R United Kingdom, R does not know what United Kingdom is. So I have to put those things um, in quotation marks. Um, basically, when you when you work with characters or you know like letters, words um, in programming, you usually have to put them um, in quotation marks. Okay. So these are my two vectors. Um, and what I'm going to do next uh, is try to kind of like interrogate those vectors. There are a lot of inbuilt functions in R that allow you to you know, find things out about vectors. One that I often use is the length vector. So just the word length, it's a function. So I open and close parentheses. Um, and if I write um, the name of a vector uh, as an argument in the length function, it will tell me how many values that vector has. So if I write COVID cases here, so length, open and close parentheses, COVID cases, and I run uh, this command, um, it will return the number five to me because COVID cases has five values in it. Conversely, if I do the same with uh, countries, it will return the number three because there are three values in the countries vector. So that is often very that is often a very useful um, thing to do uh, to know how long uh, a vector is. Um, something else that you often want to know is what kind of vector you have. Um, and you use that with the type of function. So I write type of with no separators in between. It's all one word. Open and close parentheses. And then write COVID cases. So that returns double, which could be a bit of a confusing name for people. Um, double here just means like a floating number, like a decimal. Um, so R differentiates between um, double uh, and integer for numbers. So if they're like integers or if they're floating numbers. So it tells me that the COVID cases vector uh, contains values that are numbers basically. And if I do the same for um, countries, it returns character um, because that is yeah, that is what R calls um, this kind of um, text information, basically. 
Another useful thing, another useful function, um, especially for more complicated um, data types, uh, is this str function, which uh, stands for structure. Oops. Um, so if I ask r what the structure of COVID cases is, then it will tell me that it is uh, a numeric. See, r it can be a bit confusing. So here it called it double, here it calls it like a number. You, you'll get used to it. Those things mean the same in r more or less. Um, it tells me that it has a length of five. So one, two, five is what that colon means. And you start at one and you finish at five, but it includes everything in between. And it also tells me um, what the actual values are. Once you start working with more complicated data structures than something like a vector, uh, you want to be able to get like the full information, like some things would be um, left out, but structure does give you a lot of information. And if I do the same thing with countries and run this, uh, it does something similar. It tells me that this is a character vector. Um, it has values that go from one until three, and these are its three values. Um, so this is how you create um, vectors in R. You can also use this C function uh, to add things um, to your vectors. So for example, in this countries that I was keeping an eye of how they were going in terms of COVID cases, um, I actually have to add some more countries. And the way I do that is by saying, um, I want to, I don't want to change the name of my vector. Uh, yeah, the name of my object. Um, so I'm going to use the same object name, countries, and assign to that, again, using the concatenate function, the very same vector, so countries, and add something extra. So let's say I will add Germany because that's where my sister lives. So this might be a little bit complicated. So basically what this function here does is it says, concatenate these three countries that R already knows about, these three that it has saved, and add to that another country called Germany and save them in the same um, object as before. This is basically like updating our weight in kilograms um, argument from 55 to 80 or whatever it was. So if I do this, and write countries to see its content. You can see that Germany has now been added. And it has been added at the end because the way I wrote this, I said first these three countries and then Germany. Um, you can use the same thing to add um, a value at the beginning of your vector. So again, I use the C function. Um, I write countries. But this time, instead of adding this country at the end, I'm going to put it at the beginning. So I was also interested in how Australia was doing, because that's where my partner is from. So I'm going to write Australia, and I'm going to separate it with a comma from countries, and I'm going to run this. And if I interrogate the content of countries again, we'll see that Australia has now been added as well, and it has been added at the beginning of the vector, it is now my first value instead of the United Kingdom. OK, um, so that was a bit about vectors. Um, and again, I want to give a bit of a summary of what I just said. So a vector is the simplest uh, data structure in R. It is composed by a series of values that are of the same type. So they're a character, or they are a numeric, or double in R. Uh, there are other vector types. Um, one that we will be using today is uh, the logical uh, for true or false, so like Booleans, um, integer, as I mentioned before, and two others we won't discuss at all, which is complex and raw. You, you don't need any of that for this workshop. 
Um, the other data structure, other than vectors, I said that uh, vectors are the simplest data structure. We will be using another data structure um, in this workshop in general, not today. Um, and that is uh, the tibble, uh, which is a kind of data frame. So just a bit of a summary. And I've mentioned a couple of times, and I don't know if you've caught it, but um, I mentioned a couple of times that vectors um, are composed of series of values that are of the same type. So now I want you to try out and see what happens um, if you try to add values of different types in the same object, in the same vector. Um, so just you know, copy these um, from you know the screen. Uh, try them out in your. Um, sorry, it's getting a bit late in the day. Um, write them uh, in your script. Uh, try them out, and then um, use the type of um, function to check the data type for each of those objects. So the num car, num logical, car logical, and this tricky one. And um, let's try for 10 minutes for this. Um, we can also take less time um, if you um, finish faster. If there are any questions, feel free to ask.
Okay, we're about halfway through the time and I see uh, a few green check marks uh, already. Um, I'm kind of tempted to start talking about the solution already. Um, if someone is still actively trying to figure out what's going on, please give us a red X mark at this point so I know to give you more time. And I see the green check marks going up, which is wonderful. <laughs> All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop it. And can I copy this? Yes, I can. So I'm just going to copy this. I'm sorry, I'm cheating. I know you couldn't do it because I haven't given you the slides. Um, but I'm just going to run all of these. Um, and I'm actually going to cheat again, and I'm not going to use the, the function that I told you to use, um, but I'm just going to look at the values over here. Um, so we can see that the first one that we wanted, the num car over here is a character. Um, so you can see that we had three numbers and one character, um, and now they've all been turned into characters. So basically what R did here in the background is it didn't throw an error. As you can see, it didn't tell you, oh, you're not allowed to have multiple data types in one vector. It just silently did it and it changed all of them into a character. So R will try to change everything uh, to be um, in a data type that doesn't lose you any information. So, um, it can transform one um, that it understands when it's a number as something that has the value of one or the value of you know two as the value of two, three as the value of three. Uh, it doesn't understand A. It can preserve it as A and display it, but it doesn't understand it. Um, so by changing all of them into a character, um, it doesn't understand what those things mean, uh, but it mean, but you know, it it preserves them and they look uh, the same to us. Um, that wasn't a great explanation, um, but basically, it tries to compress them, smush them into something that is the same, um, and that doesn't lose any information. And because um, R doesn't really understand characters anyway, it can transform anything into a character and assume that you know the person that's looking at it will be able to make some kind of sense um, of it. Something that is interesting, if you look at the um, num logical uh, vector is that we had one, two, three, true, which is this kind of logical value. True has been changed into one. So, when R converts those values to be um, of the same data type, it can convert logical values into numbers, and it can convert numbers into characters, and that is the order in which it goes. It can not convert characters into numbers, um, and I don't think it can convert numbers into um, logical values either. So true, it translates as one, and zero, and uh, false, it translates as zero. And there's also this tricky um, vector here, which we can see is, a, is um, a series of values, one, two, three, which are numbers, and then this four, which is in quotation marks. And if we look at what kind of data this is over here in tricky, we can see that they've all been converted to characters. So basically when you tell R that something is in quotation marks, it's like, okay, it's a character. So this four, it just understands as a character, which means it doesn't really understand it. That four could be an A, and R would basically have the same understanding of it when it is um, this kind of character type. Okay. Um, if there is interest uh, in this, I can also 
you know, show you some other um, resources where you can see about like uh, this conversion that R does um, or um, coercion is what it's actually called um, until it finds this common denominator so that it doesn't lose any information. Um, I just want you to be aware that R does this because sometimes um, you might get confused uh, if you're not aware of it. Um, and okay, we don't have a huge amount of time. So I will kind of quickly show you how to um, subset vectors and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about um, missing values. So I won't go into um, great level of detail on these things just because we're a bit short on time. Okay, so subsetting vectors. Um, I already talked about how you can create uh, vectors and how you can add uh, additional values to those vectors. Um, you know, like find out information about like, you know, how long they are and what type they are and all those things. Um, but how do you access like the actual values of the vectors? How do you um, find those out? Um, in R, you can use um, like this square bracket notation. Um, so if I try to access, whoops my uh, COVID cases. So let's say I know that I have, um, you know, this vector called COVID cases and it has some numerical values in it. And I want to find out what the second value is. I could just type the number two for the second value. And if I run this, it will return um, the second value in my vector. And if I want to double check that by looking at my vector, I can see that indeed one um, is the second value of that vector. And I can do this um, as many times as I want. So I can actually pass here um, a whole vector um, that tells R to just like repeat those values as many times as I want. So I can tell R, I want the second value, and then I want the first value, and then I want the third value, and then I want the second value again. And if I run this, it will just return the second value, the first value, the third value, and the second value again. So this is how you kind of like access um, the content of vectors. You can also um, use logical uh, values like these trues and falses uh, that we saw earlier um, to kind of like select specific um, values in your vector. So I'm going to write this in a bit of a strange way. Um, but let's say that I want to access all the non-zero values um, for my COVID cases vector. So because I know what the, what the values in my vector are, I could write in these square brackets over here that I want I don't want the first value, which is zero, and I do want all the other values, which are non-zero. So I can do this because I already know the contents of my vector, and it's a small vector, so I remember it. So if I do this, oh. <laughs> Okay, um, I forgot to add um, the concatenate uh, function to create a vector of those values. So R was like, I have no idea what you want from me. But if I do this now, uh, you can see that R returns um, all the, well, it returns the second, third, fourth, and fifth um, value. Uh, and it leaves out the first one because I told it false. This is a bit of a weird way to do this. Like you wouldn't normally write out um, this, um, you know, vector of logical uh, values. But what you could do is use a condition that says, I want all the 
values that are bigger than zero. And um, you could actually, um, I have, I have some cheat sheets because remembering um, a whole workshop to live code is taxing on my memory and my memory is not incredible. Um, so what did I want to show here? Right, yeah. So if I want to find out which COVID cases are bigger than zero, I could type this and say COVID cases greater than zero. And if I run this, it returns this vector that I had, that I previously created for myself, right? Um, it says that, it, it logically evaluates this claim and says, zero is not bigger than zero, so that is false. One is bigger than zero, so that is true, uh, and so on for three, one, and 61. Um, so I could use this expression over here um, inside my square brackets to access only the things that are, uh, only the values that are greater than zero. So the way I do this is by writing COVID cases, open and close these square brackets that help us access um, the, the, the values, and then just type COVID cases greater than zero. And that returns me um, all the COVID cases that are greater than zero, which is really neat. Um, so there are various kind of like logical operators that you can use. So there is the greater than sign, obviously, that we just use the smaller than sign. Um, there's also an operator. So I'll just actually write this as a comment so R doesn't complain. So uh, greater than. smaller than, um, I have a newish keyboard and I'm still not entirely used to it. Um, this stands for not, and this stands for uh, identity basically. Um, so notice that it is two uh, equation marks, not just uh, one equation mark. And you can also have multiple conditions at the same time. Um, so for example, if I wanted all the COVID cases that are, um, you know, one digits for whatever reason, I could say uh, non-zero one digits. Um, I could say that I want the COVID cases that are uh, greater than zero. And also, the COVID cases that are um, smaller than 10. So now I only want the COVID cases that are basically between one and nine. So if I run, oh. <laughs> oops, uh, smaller than 10. So now it only returns the values uh, one, three, and one again. Um, and I'm just gonna say one more thing um, before I let you enjoy your afternoon, uh, which is about missing values. Um, I mentioned that R um, has a kind of inbuilt way of dealing with missing values. So if um, my COVID cases um, vector had a missing value, uh, which in R uh, is denoted as NA for non-applicable, I guess. So I could write, I could create this vector by saying zero, one, three, and then let's just say that I lost uh, the information for this. So this NA, um, R can understand as a value that is missing. Um, 
And what R will do uh, if you try to work with a vector that has missing values is it will try to make you extremely aware of the fact that there, there is a missing value. So if I wanted to interrogate this vector and find out what like, you know, the highest um, COVID cases numbers that we had um, for this very short period of time, I could write, um, I don't remember if I said the largest or the smallest, let's go for the smallest number of cases, um, which is with this function called min, which um, returns the smallest value of a numerical uh, vector. So if I ask it, what's the smallest value um, in the COVID cases in a vector, and I run this, it will tell me an a. <laughs> because there is a missing value um, in this function, r will not let me uh, forget that that is there just in case uh, I'm not. Uh, it will also do this if I ask it for the maximum value. Uh, it will again tell me the maximum value is also an A because there is that missing value there. We just don't know what it is. Um, that could get annoying uh, if you want to do some calculations with uh, your vectors. So of course, R has uh, created a way for you to tell to tell it that, yes, I know, please remove those missing values. Um, and if we ask the documentation for those values like min and max, we can see that there is an argument uh, called na.rm, so remove ENAs, which um, tells R if we want those values removed or not. As we can see here in the usage, the default is false. So by default, R will not remove those NA values. Um, we have to be explicit that we want them to be removed for our calculation. So I'm just going to say na.rm equals true. And if I now run this, it will tell me that the minimum um, number of cases that we had was zero. And if I do the same with max uh, and add the na remove, uh, it will tell me that it is 61. Presumably, yes. So, um, yeah. Um, and just as a bit of a hint of what we would have done if we had more time, I will just say that there is also a function in R um, that returns logical values uh, based on whether a function, uh, a value is missing or not, and that is the is an A function. Uh, so if I pass it the vector COVID cases and A and run it, see it returns um, false, 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 true, false. So it tells me that the first three values are not missing, the fourth value is missing, and the fifth value is not missing. And with that, I will stop. I will save this, um, and I will share it with you um, later today or tomorrow 